It's money, but not quite in the way you think. Hello, Emmett Ryan here from Ball in Europe, and it is once again great to be back with you here today talking about, well, I suppose, money and logistics, two, you know, hugely important things in basketball and politics too. Yeah, yeah, this is not the normal thing, I know, but we do some weird stuff here on this channel, you know, we try and get deep dive, deep down, but this is all because, of course, Dimitris Atutis, the great, great coach, two-time EuroLeague champion head coach Dimitris Atutis, he had some interesting things to say about his dream of where he'd like to see the EuroLeague to get to. And he fully acknowledged that it's not able to do it today or tomorrow. So I'm going to go into those challenges. Essentially, it's what's stopping Europe and EuroLeague, which is the one he referred to, from doing an NBA-style platform. Just two things based on finances, but not quite in the way you think for one of them. And the third part is, though, oddly how the format issue is not as big of an obstacle as it might initially seem. So there's a lot to get through. It's going to be very detailed. It's going to be kind of, you know, not very much about basketball, oddly, uh, although it impacts basketball, so that's good. And yeah, we're going to get into it. We're going to get onto it. But if you, before we get into it, please subscribe below. That would be great. Or say above or below, wherever you can see the subscribe button. Please hit that now. Every extra view helps us off out an awful lot. But now let's get through the obvious part, which is actual revenue. So when we're talking about money, we don't mean of being at NBA level money. What we're talking about here is the difference in the levels of money across different clubs in Europe and EuroLeague in particular. We've already seen there's significant wealth disparity within EuroLeague, like the spending of a Panathinaikos or a Monaco, utterly, utterly on a different level to say an Alba Berlin or an Asvel Basket. So that gap, and these are, you know, huge within that already at 18 makes it a challenge. But it gets worse because here's the thing, while Alba and Aswell, and I suppose you can throw Paris in there, might not spend at your Monaco, Panathinaikos, Olympiakos level, and obviously there's gaps all the way in between as well, we can throw those in too, they are still amongst the bigger spenders in Europe, like throwing on six teams to get to 24, another six to get to 30, that's a huge, huge ask to get to a stage where you can do that. And that's why we're talking about the, that was a dream for Tudis, and he openly acknowledged that. But even within the 18, it's a huge, huge issue for getting competitive balance because North American sports, a huge advantage they have, essentially, we are going to go to a second huge advantage to have that's money-related as well, but is that they're basically designed to remove wealth disparity or at least spending ability disparity. Obviously, owning the Lakers is worth more than owning the Hornets, for example, but at the same time, what those two teams can spend to create the best team is far, far closer, especially when it comes to salaries. Obviously, the salary cap in the NBA, there is a luxury tax, but, you know, largely speaking, the gaps are relatively closer than the gap between the top and the 18th team in European spending. All the way down to the 30th, it's, you know, we're, we're off screen literally here. So, and that's North American sports at large. Even baseball, which has by far and away the softest cap system, is designed to ensure that it's not a complete disaster if you're the 30th best revenue generating side in baseball and therefore revenue spending side, uh, well, sorry, ex uh, expending side in baseball. Obviously, there is disparity there and it is noticeable. Like, if you haven't seen Moneyball in the description, uh, you know, that's pretty accurate. That's commonplace in Europe, in European sports, not just European basketball. So that's a huge, huge issue to deal with. And obviously, within that, you go, well, could we not just do a salary cap in Europe? Well, we're going to get to the tax issue with that in a second, but fundamentally there are huge issues. One, European labour laws do put some limits on it, although they have been overcome for the most part. But there's just an element of capacity to spend. EuroLeague has obviously brought in its updated financial player play, which is going to involve money going to be put into a pot for teams who spend above the higher limit of what's allowed. But even with the higher limit, it's not a cap. It's based on the revenue that club itself generates. So the limit for Alba versus Panathinaikos, for example, is going to be different. The limit for any two clubs is going to be different. And so therefore, what's required to be spent to go into paying what's effectively a luxury tax is going to be different. Therefore, it's not going to be like a salary cap. That's not how FFP to any degree works or will ever work. So getting competitive balance when you've got wealth disparity is naturally very hard and frankly increases the price of getting up to being on the same level as those teams who obviously have greater wealth than you. So that's a huge issue. But it's not just about how much you can spend. 
It's how far the money you spend can go. So the NBA has got enormous advantages when it comes to tax situations. So there are slight differences state to state in the US when it comes to tax. People talk a lot about Texas situation, for example, and it's very favorable uh, income tax situation for residents, with there being no state income tax as such. But the thing is, that's state income tax. There is still city level, and of course, most importantly, there's federal level. So while there are differences in taxation, they are vastly different to the wild, wild differences across Europe, like the tax situation you can pay, pay in certain countries, particularly in nations where there's an obvious benefit designed to bring in high earners, designed to bring in athletes of a certain level, where basically you can write off an awful lot of your tax. That's a huge issue. And you can't just replace it, say, with support from the government. The EU-based clubs in EuroLeague know this all too well. There's a little term called illegal state aid. For those of you who don't know, I'm Irish, I live in Dublin, and I cover technology. Covering illegal state aid has kind of been a thing for me the last, my entire career. So yes, illegal state aid is a very big deal in Europe and people don't like it. So you can't, so, but, but, but the problem is, grand, if it was for everybody, that's fine. But what's permitted, say, in Serbia, Turkey, which is home to combined four EuroLeague teams, in theory, you can, could get state aid uh, and it's perfectly fine. And that's a huge difference when you think about it. Like, you know, the ability to generate revenue and the nature of taxation. And let's get back to tax. Asvel, Paris, but not Monaco. Well, actually, let's throw Monaco in. Asvel, Paris, and Monaco don't just all play in EuroLeague. They play in the same professional national league. Asvel and Paris have to deal with France's extremely high tax for high earners. Great. Monaco is a tax haven. <laughs> you know, so in the same national league, never mind EuroLeague, there's a tax disparity. But it just explodes beyond that. So the variance in taxes and so what the money is really worth to players changes wildly. And I said that the NBA has a secondary benefit when it comes to tax. And that's that taxation, if you're an American citizen, follows you wherever you live in the world. There's only two countries in the world that do this for income tax that I can think of anyway. Uh, the, if there are any others, they're microstates. Uh, those are the United States of America, the world's biggest economy and home to the biggest basketball league in, you know, known existence. The other is Eritrea, which basically makes North Korea look like it's a free and loving place. Yeah. That's it. Uh, nowhere else does it. It's extremely odd. And by the way, it's one of the reasons that when an American complains about the process of paying their taxes, you should have a bit of sympathy. It is actually a huge nuisance in the method by which you pay taxes in the US. If they complain about the amount, then go at them, whatever. But the process, they deserve sympathy on. It is a nuisance the way they, the method they use to pay tax is very annoying uh, for if you're an American citizen. So yes, um, that's obviously a factor for the US players in Europe. Michael, well, doesn't that negate the issue for the Americans in Europe? And to a large degree, it does. The problem is the majority of players who are professional in EuroLeague are not US citizens and aren't impacted by this. And so therefore the European teams, the EuroLeague teams, don't get to have that as a natural, you know, mover for them. And like EuroLeague's approach to FFP has been designed to try and factor in the difference in taxation across Europe. But it's basically like, you know, putting a band-aid on a gaping wound. Like there's very little you can do to directly do it. Oh, the only real option in truth is to have some sort of very, very strict form of salary cap, which is not going to get through and also is going to face all kinds of ramifications. That's a lot harder to get through with, say, you know, any form of European court. So it's tough for tax and it's terrible for wealth disparity. Yet there's one reason I think we can have a bit of belief in Coach Atutis' dream. So this is the one I think a lot of people would have thought was the biggest non-money reason for it to not be able to happen. Thing is, there's already a format that exists that shows it can work in Europe. So essentially, obviously, the NBA is a closed league of 30 teams, and uh, that includes one in Canada, but we've mentioned how American tax follows players, so that's solved. Yearly, getting to 30 teams and having the playoffs format all the way through to the end is an enormous ask. Even the 24 teams, it's a huge ask. So we'll break it down for a few a few tiers here. This is, got, this is a very long video, I know, but this is worth talking about. So first off, Atutis mentioned how we've a bit of everything. Everybody plays each other twice. Then we have playoffs, like the NBA, as he said. 
and then we have a final four like the NCAA. And that makes sense financially, being frank about it, because it ensures parity, which is always liked in European sport. Uh, the playoffs make sense as a format to decide the final four because you still want to benefit the teams who've done well in the regular season with the home advantage, essentially. And the final four, because it's a great TV event. And that was the big reason of Above all, that I thought Euroleague would never consider this. But now, after thinking this morning and this afternoon, I've come to change my mind completely. So the politics obviously stands out. But a fully closed league, won't that annoy FIBA? It's not going to be a fully closed league, is the first thing. And how we avoid it being a fully closed league is we look at the Adriatic League, the ABA League, ABA League, depending on where you're from, how you call it. They have two divisions. They have, you know, a multi-state league. And they play playoffs through to the end. And it kind of works. Like, there is promotion and relegation still. Now, it isn't conference-based, so it isn't perfect, but it shows that it is a doable format. And Ireland, which is effectively an amateur league, like we have a few professionals, managed a conference system for a couple of years with relegation and promotion and um, still worked out okay. And, uh, yeah, so it's it's doable, essentially, while keeping... The big fear, of course, would be a political explosion between FIBA and EuroLeague. And we've just reached a point where they're at peace together. And it's taken a while. Let's not dance around it. This is a way to keep everybody happy. And it might well be worth looking at when we see this eventual EuroCup BCL merger, if it ends up looking an awful lot like how the ABA League and ABA League 2 work in terms of the divisions and format and guaranteeing a certain number of games, guaranteeing forms of access, but also having a form of promotion relegation a la the Europa League and the Conference League in football, for example. So it's doable. I oddly think that the NBA format with a European tweak of promotion relegation remaining is actually doable in Europe. Now we get to the part of, but what about the Final Four? Because for EuroLeague, the Final Four is its crown jewel. It's basically its best chance to sell the best of its product on one weekend every year. It's obviously a huge earner for, the, for EuroLeague as well. Like cities want to go for it, they bid for it, and it's a it's a big big deal to host a final four, and that's an issue, for sure. But having covered sports media rights for quite a while, uh, I would go so far as to say I'm one of the highest authorities on it in Ireland, uh, frankly, because uh, of how much I've covered it and how many people I've spoken to about it. I think a move to playoffs long term wouldn't actually be impossible, as in even a finals. So. The reason people are saying never going to do that is the one time EuroLeague did do playoffs, it was the year of the Super Pro League split. It was seen as a failure. And that's right, turn of the century, that makes sense. Uh, with the way people viewed content back then, the way people engaged with it, it did make sense because we were still far more of a TV and newspaper society. We're not anymore. Now, sports content as a whole is so valuable that the big thing for TV providers is volume of content as in the number of events they can show per event so while euroleague would suddenly lose its crown jewel what it would be offering instead would be let's assume they stick with best of five series the whole way through because it's the most logical and likely outcome whether to do it suddenly you go from having well there's these four games we'll have on one weekend to we're going to give you three more best of five series we will not have a third place series do not mention a third place series if you do that i want you to leave now uh, yeah, we also get to get rid of the third place game. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. So I'm thinking, right, suddenly you're offering them a lot more games, a lot more content, a lot more hours, essentially, because live sport is by far and away the most valuable property in any capacity for net, for linear television right now. That and news programs are the only things that really generate revenue in the direct sense because people watch not stuff that doesn't have to be watched live, but it's largely watched on catch. The odd event-based TV but pretty much it's sport is your reliable. And like I see it in the sports I commentate on, is that the, the volume of content is what really appeals to the broadcaster. They know they will have X number of games with a reliable number of viewers over and over. No, you won't get the ratings you get for the Final Four. You won't. But what you will get cumulatively is far more viewers overall across the continent. And that, to me, is something that can be built. So, yeah, the format, which I was... If you'd asked me even, you know, when Utudis made his comments like, only a few days back... I said, well, the format's not going to work. They'll never move away from the Final Four. Go, actually, no, the format's not a problem. So could we get to a stage where this is doable? Absolutely. But I won't make a two in this. It's a, it's a far away thing. I would say it'll be when I go grey, but that happened a long time ago. So uh, let's say it'll be when uh, I'm a lot, lot, lot older. 
Um, because what you need realistically is investment in the sport across the board. I mean that both at the grassroots level, building up, we are seeing more of that, but also in terms of, um, you know, people willing to see there's money to be made in professional basketball in Europe. Because for right now, if you want to do well, you assume you're losing money in some capacity or else you're doing something very, very clever with tax. And the tax regime issue is going to be the biggest one. Far more, I, I think t- solving the tax problem will be a bigger issue than solving the wealth disparity one. The reason is you control the wealth disparity one if you're, you know, the basketball teams and the investors. The tax one, you've got to work around legal matters. You've got to work around different states' approaches to life and things. You've got to find a way to convince all your members you've got to observe this particular format. And speaking of format, I left out another reason why I think the league will be fine format-wise because the ABA League has also shown us that it does not abandon the National Leagues entirely. So what do ABA League te- teams do when it's cup season? They go back and play their National Cups. What about those National Leagues? They rejoin the National League at a late stage, uh, basically pre-playoffs, to then enter the knockout format. So you could see that happen more across Europe, really, with the EuroLeague teams, assuming there was an agreement, obviously, with FIBA. But given it already works with the ABA League, I think it's very doable. Uh, with that. So the National Leagues could still survive and have a reason to exist and thrive. So, yeah, it's doable from a former perspective. Financially, you've got two big issues, wealth disparity and tax. And again, tax to me, man- tax management is your bigger issue. So it's complicated, it's tough, and this was definitely very little about basketball this video, but it was about the future of basketball, so that's something. And if you enjoyed that, if you enjoyed our less logistics, I suppose, or detaily videos, please be sure to subscribe it. Everyone helps and uh, get the word out there that we're doing all this. Really, really appreciate it. And of course, we have videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And yeah, until then, I will see you next time.